Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer for the uh, Veterans Interview Program, part of the Library of Congress Oral History Project. And uh, we're going to be talking today to David Murray, a Navy veteran of World War II. And uh, Dennis Daly is our camera operator here. And uh, we're very fortunate to have you here, David. Uh, where were you born and when were you born? I was born in Jersey City. Uh, I wondered about that. <laughs> and that was in 1923, November of 23. Okay, all right. Sometimes uh, I ask the kids I talk to, how old do you think I am? So I don't tell them how old, I simply right. indicate the year I was born. Right. It's a math problem. <laughs> 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 now, did you have uh, brothers and sisters? No brothers, no sisters. Uh-huh. As a matter of fact, my, uh, my mother came from Scotland. She came over here and was employed as a domestic servant. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. And I came on the scene, I don't know how. <laughs> Did she meet your father over here? I have no idea. Really? I would guess so. Uh huh. And uh, I've hidden behind the story that my father was killed on the Hudson River in a tugboat. Now that's just a figment of my imagination. I see. And I have used it simply to disguise the fact that I, I had no father. Isn't that something? Yeah. How about that? Well now, where did you go to school? I was taken back to Scotland by my mother as a babe in arms. Oh. And I was taken to the Isle of Lewis. The Isle of Lewis is in the Outer Hebrides, mm -hmm. far north of Scotland. Way up off the coast. Right. And I went to school there. I started school there. And I stayed with my grandmother. Thereafter, she died. And I was taken to her sister's place in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Again, in Scotland. Mm, of course. And I finished my schooling there at the age of 14. You have a very soft, wonderful touch to your speech. And I wondered when I first met you whether it was Jersey or whether it was Scotland, but I think it's Scotland. <laughs> that, that's great. And you finished schooling at, at 14. I left school at 14. And then what did you do? I got a job as an office boy in a newspaper. In Glasgow? In Glasgow. How about that? And that lasted, well, almost until no, just until after war broke out. When war broke out, the 3rd of September, 1939, mm -hmm. on that occasion I was at the Western Infirmary filling sandbags and oh. stacking them against the window of the first floor. How about that? That was what we were doing. Isn't that something? Gosh. As Churchill, uh, not Churchill, but Chamberlain made his speech right, at that right. time. And you were 16 years old then, huh? Right. 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 And did you hear Chamberlain's speech on radio? No, I did not. Uh -huh. No, I was busy. Yeah, <laughs> but I can remember. But we that. knew it was coming. Oh, yeah. yeah. And of course, that famous, famous photograph of him coming off the plane, raving a piece of paper in his hand. Peace in our time. Peace in our time. Oh <laughs> my goodness. What what a what a historical boo-boo that was. Yes. Yeah. Well, okay, so there you were, and you were preparing for uh, possible invasion by the by the Germans. Oh absolutely. Yes. Yes, indeed. We were very much aware of their strength in the air. Yes. And we were concerned about bombing at that time. Of course. So that was the purpose of stacking up those sure, sandbags. Sure. Yeah. Do you remember uh, Rudolf Hess 
the the Nazi and and, yes. and he's coming down in Scotland. Absolutely. You were you were nearby. <laughs> very it? close. Very close. As you remember of that. Isn't yes. That something? Uh -huh. Boy, you have really lived some but history. But that was somewhat later in war. Yeah, I, I think it was 1940. I think it was 1940 that that happened. Could be. I Could think be. so. I think so because. Well, anyway, um, then. How about the Blitz? Were you affected by the Blitz that far north? Clyde Bank, which was adjacent to Glasgow, just down the River Clyde, right. took a terrible beating. Did it? Oh yes. My. As a matter of fact, during that period I was at sea and I was going back and forth across the Atlantic. Uh, what were you doing on going back and forth across the Atlantic? Well, the, sh the ship I was on was called the Cameronia. It was a canard boat, mm -hmm. formerly a passenger ship, right. but now it was a, we carried mainly uh, whiskey from Scotland mm -hmm. and war supplies from New York. Oh. And we were back and forth, back and forth there. My gosh. And it was a fast enough ship to not need a convoy, so we traveled alone. Mm -hmm. That was unusual. Like the Queens. The Queens like, traveled along. That's right. Too. Yeah. Right. How about that? Well, how many passages, do you know how many passages, crossings you made? I made six passages. I think or so. If you look at this book, you'll uh -huh. see, that's uh, oh, this is a Siemens registration sure. card. Continuous certificate of discharge. And the opening page was with the Cameronia. Aha. Uh -huh. Cameronia, after Cameron, of course, a wonderful Scottish name. Well, isn't that, so you were a merchant seaman. Right, exactly. And, and as such, and as a youngster, good golly, you were young for that. Well, I was an ordinary seaman. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was my rating. You know, that, that's, that's a step up, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> From what I was doing, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever make Abel? Well, I didn't make Abel, but I was sailor. Uh -huh. So I got paid the same as Abel Seaman. Oh, did you really? Oh. But uh, they didn't give me the rating. I see. Now, were you able to uh, save money, uh, save, put something away? No, no, no we never we, saved money. We didn't do that in those no, days, did we? No, no there was things to do and places to go. Oh, and I should say. Well, then, besides, besides, um, uh, Glasgow and, and New York. <clears throat> did you get ashore in, in the States when you came over here? Sure did. Had, had uh, some liberty ashore? Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, younger fellows on the crew were given the job when getting to New York of supervising the discharge of the cargo. Oh. And as I say, that was whiskey. Mm -hmm. Nothing but whiskey. Mm -hmm. And the waterfront was a tough place in New York at 1940. Oh boy, yeah, I should say. And lively and the stevedores would make it their make their purpose to drop uh, a load of whiskey cases. They would do that in order to get just a few bottles for themselves. Uh -huh. And while I was there supervising the whole thing, I had to cooperate with them. Mm -hmm. You didn't dare cross those people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I would get a few bottles, too. Sure. And that was a way to make a few bucks when I did go ashore. Of course. Make a few friends, too. Absolutely. <laughs> and e even at that raw age, I was a frequent visitor to the waterfront dives in New York. I'm not surprised at that. <laughs> well, you know, that, that uh, favorite period in my life, too, but, you know, you were in New York in the early 40s, and, and <clears throat> I think of all the wonderful things that went on in those days in New York, like, like the big bands, you know, the, the swing mm -hmm. bands, and, and all those wonderful things that happened in those days. Right. I'm trying to think of the, the bandmaster that I did see. Um, 
movie theaters had band yes. shows too. Right. And uh, I remember seeing a band there. He had a Spanish name. Oh, Xavier Cougat? Xavier sure. Cougat, right. Cuba. And his wife, who was a famous dancer at yes, that time right. too. So that was one of the highlights I, I talked about when I got back to Scotland. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> and you know, as you point out, <coughs> not only the theaters, but all the hotels had big orchestras. The, the Pennsylvania Hotel and the uh, Biltmore and so forth. Yeah, and, I believe that. Yeah. I yeah. never saw it. <laughs> you never saw that? <laughs> well, this is absolutely fascinating. I've never spoken to anyone who's had the experience that you've had. And I can just imagine you as a, as a young fellow in New York. And it's interesting about how they would drop a crate of the, of the whiskey just to break it. Absolutely. So yeah. that they could get something for themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and it reminds us of the, of the Kennedy family here in this country, you know, the old man. You bet. <laughs> who just... Ruled. That was his bread and butter. That was it. That's how they made their money. Yes, you indeed. You bet with Scotch whiskey, you bet. <laughs> Isn't that something? Uh, well, tell us some more about that. Any, any funny uh, humorous experiences that you can remember? No, I can't think of anything. on on that particular run. Although I will say that one of the unusual things I was witness to was a burial at sea. Oh. One of our crewmates died at sea mm -hmm. and it was a 10 day crossing at that time. Right. So rather than keep him to arrive on the other side, sure. they simply buried him at sea. Yes. And of course they took a cargo hatch cover Mm -hmm. Laid them on there, waited and sewed up in canvas. Did they, did they have the a flag, the flag over, over the, the carcass yeah, and, and just tilted up, and tilted them into the water. Yes, holding on to the flag, of course. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I had that experience uh, in the Navy, seeing that. But <coughs> the. Um, the living conditions aboard uh, the Cameronia, for example, what were they like? <laughs> Pretty miserable. <laughs> 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 there were probably a hundred cockroaches for every crewmate that I had. <laughs> <laughs> right. Was she a pretty good sized ship? Yes, she was. She had two funnels, uh -huh. two masts, good sized passenger right. ship. Right, right. And uh, the loads that we would bring back would be uh, pig iron, mm -hmm. uh, airplane parts, trucks, that sort of stuff. Right. right, right. And that, of course, was to feed the war machine in Britain. Of course, of course. And the airplane parts for the Royal Air Force and, right. and that sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, in, that <clears throat> in that exchange, <laughs> um, how much turnaround time did you have? Very little time. It was important it was to get the material back. Right. Forth. It would take us perhaps two days to discharge that whiskey cargo. Uh -huh. And maybe three days to load. load. And then it was back again. And probably about the same turnaround time in Glasgow. I see. Right. And in, in Glasgow, we were invariably told from the German broadcasting operation that uh, this was by a character known as Lord Haw Haw. I remember that. And he always predicted that the sea, uh, the Atlantic fish were going to be in a drunken brawl mm -hmm. when they'd sink the Cameronia. Oh, God. They knew very well what we were carrying. They knew when we left. Oh, I know. They just didn't know the route we would take. Right, exactly. <clears throat> well, you know, there was a famous, famous saying <clears throat> in this country, and I'm sure it was used uh, in, in Britain as well, in Scotland, that loose lips sink 
ships. Remember that? Absolutely. You're yes. absolutely not to speak, particularly <laughs> if you went to a bar and you got <laughs> drunk, you know. There was, there was always somebody, there was always somebody on the other side. That's true. Hanging mm -hmm. out, snooping around. This, this is fascinating, David, to hear your story about this. Tell us some more about your experiences on that Cameronia. Well, as an ordinary seaman, now that that meant that you 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 were a, a, above the the deck swabbing yes duty, for example. Well, that was part of my duty. Really, part of my duty was to see that the captain got his tea and crumpets at three uh -huh. o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and if I wasn't there in time, and if his tea wasn't hot enough, I was told about it. You heard about that. Uh, another thing I was given as a, as a routine duty was lowering a bucket of water mm -hmm. into the ocean, pulling it up and taking the temperature. I don't know why. <coughs> I was just told to do it, so I did it. And then I would read the, the numbers on the log line. Mm -hmm. That was a log line we trailed behind the ship. Right. Gave us the mileage we covered mm -hmm. and what have you. Right. Yeah, that's curious. I wonder, I wonder, I'm trying to think why they would need the temperature of the water, need to know that. Must have been some reason for that. Well, the uh, the uh, current in the Atlantic would change. You know, it would come up the East Coast, yeah, the Gulf Current, a Gulf, and spread across the Atlantic. Right. Well, I'm sure if you were say ten miles one way or ten miles the other, there uh, might be a difference. Of course. Because the normal water of the Atlantic was very, very, very cold. Very cold. Wow. But up farther north, yes. where you did not have that Gulf current, oh, it would be even colder. Terrible. Right. Yeah. Did you have any experience with the um, transatlantic convoys a little later on in the war? Oh, yeah. Most of my experience was in the convoys. Was it? Yes. In one of the convoys I traveled in was uh, shortly the FDR had permitted the U.S. Navy to partly escort British convoys. Right. And the U.S. Navy ships would escort us halfway across the Atlantic. Half. <laughs> then they would go into Iceland. Uh-huh. Right. And that was the turnaround point. Right. Right. But we were being escorted by U.S. Navy ships in, in one convoy in particular. And they lost one of the U.S. ships. That was the very first U.S. naval ship that was sunk in World War II. Oh, okay. It's called the Reuben James. Yes, I know the story. And it was, I saw it. We you witnessed saw it. to it, absolutely. You saw it go down. <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh. It and was it was the simplest operation that you can imagine. It was torpedoed, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. But a submarine exposed itself, and of course the destroyer, not knowing any better, made a beeline for the submarine. Yeah. But there was another submarine over here. Sure. Put a yeah. torpedo right into it. That's what they call their wolf pack operations, wasn't it? It's just commonplace at that time. Oh, very common. Yeah. Well, I've, I've <clears throat> done a lot of reading about it, but I want you to tell me, uh, you know the story of PQ-17. You know that story? No, I don't. PQ was the designation for the, we the, the eastern passage from the west to the east, and PJ uh, was the designation for the convoys going from east to west. Uh -huh. But PQ-17 was a terrible thing. It was the worst tragedy of, of the war in, in the Atlantic, where <clears throat> unescorted convoy 
of merchant ships uh -huh. was com almost completely wiped out by the wolf pack. This was before, uh, before the, the, uh, the convoys were protected by escorts. The worst, worst part for the, the British merchant marine was prior to Pearl Harbor. We were taking a beating yes. in the Atlantic. Terrible. And we, we all try to form convoys. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes convoys would be broken up by bad weather. Spread out. Spread out. Wow. There was a limited space between each ship. They called them two cables. Hmm. Well, I'm not quite certain of the distance that a cable was, but I yeah. would guess about 100 yards. Mm -hmm. hmm. Recalling, you know, the distance that yes. there would be between ships. Sure. And uh, on another convoy that we had made across, we had gone, we were within three, four days of Britain. And a plane came overhead. So it was a surveillance plane of some kind. Mm -hmm. Well, a British plane ordinarily would drop flares to identify itself. Right. Well, this plane did not drop flares. And it just so happened that in that convoy, there was a plane that was carrying a Spitfire. Now that was a rare occurrence. Mm -hmm. The Spitfire was mounted on a, a ramp on the foredeck and it was simply rocketed off into mm -hmm. the wind. Right. Well, since this larger plane, a reconnaissance plane, did not identify itself, the Spitfire was sent off to go after it. Oh. And you could see the plane, you could see the Spitfire making its approach, coming down under. Right. When the plane did drop its flares. Oh my gosh. Wow. So, the Spitfire just pulled off. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness. And uh, it was too far away from Britain, however, to make it to land. Oh. So what did they do? They, they uh, circled the convoy and they plunged the ship, or the airship, the Spitfire, into the water and it came out with, uh, what do we call it? Oh yeah, the... Those names. We called them Mae West. We called them Mae West. Inflatable inflatable life. Right, preserver. but he parachuted into the water. Yeah. Oh, he parachuted. He I parachuted. See. Oh, I and see. he was picked up by one of the escort vessels. Oh, sure. But that was a Spitfire just wasted. Yeah, yeah. And they, at that time, they didn't have Spitfires to waste. No, no. Everyone counted. I know, but at the same time, that man who was so highly trained, you know, was so very important to to you save, bet. You of bet. course. I'm sure that... Because he uh, could fly another plane again. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, you know, that was always the case with seamen. Although the ship went down, the men were there to sail another day. Absolutely correct. Right. Absolutely. Right. Now, you... <clears throat> you were an American citizen because you were born here. That's right. Right. So you had dual citizenship because your mother was British. Uh -huh. British citizen, that exactly. is. Exactly. Scottish, but a British citizen. But I never took advantage of that until I was in the shipping office in Glasgow. And of course, the authorities there would determine where you were to go. Right. Well, they wanted me to go on the Russian route to Murmansk. Up around the North Cape. That's right. Wow. And I said, no, I don't want to go. Uh -huh. You have to go. No, sir. I'm an American. You can't send me there. Oh. <laughs> so they weren't satisfied that my calling myself an American. Uh -huh. So they contacted the consul 
in Glasgow. He came down to the shipping office, quizzed me, and identified me as an American. <laughs> Oh, but uh, you can't you can't send him anywhere. He doesn't choose to go. Isn't that something? <laughs> Which was really comforting. I should say. <laughs> well, I don't think there are many people that have had that experience uh, that no, you have. No, I know that. Oh, what a great story! What a great story. Well, um, so you were <clears throat> you were a member of the British Merchant Marine. Or was it the British Navy? The British Royal, Merchant Marine. The Royal Merchant Marine. No, not a Royal Merchant not Marine. Not Royal. Simply Merchant Marine. Ah. And they were made up of shipping companies of one kind or another. I see. As a matter of fact, I was on two ships that were sunk. They were both owned by the one company. They were tankers. Uh -huh. And that was the Eagle Oil and Shipping Company. All they did was transport oil from, I see. from various places. Sure. In the convoy that I spoke of where the Spitfire was lost, the convoy proceeded north of Ireland. Ships would drop off to the Clyde, mm -hmm. sail down, drop off to the Mersey, and we were continuing down and there was five ships left in the convoy. They were all tankers. Mm -hmm. We were bound for the south coast of England, right. Portsmouth, Plymouth, etc. Right. And I was at the wheel. I was quartermaster at the time. Mm -hmm. And the wheelhouse was barricaded by concrete with a, just a slit made to, for entering a har harbor or what mm -hmm. have you. But I'm at the wheel and I, I became aware of three little specks on the horizon. At first I, I thought nothing of it. And then it became clear what they were and I called to the, the third mate who was on duty at the time. Oh my God. It happened that there were three German bombers. My word. And they dropped a bomb on us but it so happened that they were flying so low that the bomb didn't, didn't get into that perpendicular position. Mm -hmm. So it just bounced off the Skipped. deck and into the water oh. and exploded there. Right. It knocked out our skiing gear and put us out of commission, really. Mm -hmm. So we abandoned ship right away because we were carrying 12,000 tons of benzene. Oh. So while we were doing that, the other ships were being attacked by other two planes. Mm -hmm. All five of those tankers were blown up. Oh, my goodness. We managed to pull our boats away, at least far enough away mm -hmm. where we weren't in the actual explosion. Although mm -hmm. we, we, heard, we felt the heat, no question oh, about I it. I can imagine. Tremendous explosion that must have been in fire. But only our ship provided any survivors from that convoy. Is that so? Yeah. And that plane, it did come back and of course took out that, the San Conrado. But in doing so, they turned around and were machine gunning the lifeboats. Mm. So, we didn't know what to do. Well, of course. Someone gave the word into the water. So we jumped into the water, out of the lifeboats, into the water. Well, there was a couple of boys who were hit, mm -hmm. but nobody was killed. We didn't lose any men on. Miraculous. Absolutely unbelievable. Oh, unbelievable. And that how, was how, the, many, how many of you were involved in that, would you say? How many men were there? 20, 30, 50? I would say more in the 30s than the mm -hmm. 40s, mm -hmm. more in th 30 in number. Just imagine. Yeah. Did some hang on to the boat itself? Or? Oh, absolutely. We held on to the lifeboats. Yeah. As when we jumped, I couldn't sure. swim. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, oh. I never did learn to swim. Oh, oh God. But, 
you know, <laughs> a lifeboat has those sure, uh, lifelines line, hanging lines, on the side. Yeah, and yeah. Just hang on to that. Yeah. I can just picture that. Oh my goodness, what an experience. Well now, you say you survived two sinkings. Yes, yes. The other time was, as I say, another tanker. Uh -huh. But this one happened to be light. In other words, it wasn't carrying the cargo. Ah. We were going out to our destination. We were bound for Aruba. And uh, we were in convoy. The convoy had to break up because of bad weather. Mm -hmm. Now the San Florentino was a particularly large tanker. It might have been the largest tanker in the British merchant fleet. Mm -hmm. But it was light and therefore very high, high in the water. Sure. A lot so, of freeboard. Absolutely. <laughs> so we became a target for submarines. Yes. They followed us rather than others. Mm -hmm. It was about midnight that we were torpedoed thrown out of bed, thrown. And of course, everybody up on deck. Even, even the down, even the engine room crew, up on deck. Mm -hmm. But a tanker, being light, was just full of air tanks. You know, there was nothing sure, in it. Very buoyant. Very buoyant. And as it happened, we tried to keep our stern to the submarine because mm -hmm. it was quite visible. Right. The stormy seas, mm -hmm. but a bright moonlight night. Oh my God. Just as bright as could be, almost like daylight. Oh. Made a beautiful picture. <laughs> <laughs> so we could spot the submarine as it's when it surfaced. Just imagine. And we had an old six inch World War I gun at the stern. We had a gun crew trying to take pot shots. <laughs> It was all futile, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but in time, they actually had to put four torpedoes into us hmm. before the ship broke in two. Really? Because while, while keeping our stern on her, we'd have to manipulate. And, right. You know, you have half the ship going this way and half. In other words, we just like, like a piece of tin, you know. Right. And it broke in half. Oh, my gosh. And as the lifeboats were being lowered into the water, the, the sides of the ship had been ripped to pieces. Mm -hmm. So the lifeboats were coming in contact with those ripped steel plates. And the boats themselves were pretty well ripped to pieces. Really? So the lifeboats were, they, they too had air tanks. Mm -hmm. Were they wooden boats? Wooden boats, mm -hmm. but along the sides you had air tanks. Right. And that kept, kept it buoyant, although the boat was loaded with water. Wow. So we were just sitting up to our waist in water. Uh-huh. Goodness sakes. And I can remember a couple of boys, one who was concerned about where the emergency supplies were. Well, he wanted the whiskey. Oh. <laughs> I know there's biscuits in the supply, but he wanted the whiskey. How about that? So he got the supplies. <laughs> but the other boy that comes to mind, and I'll never forget it, a young fellow, he was, I was about 17, 18, thereabouts. He was in his mid-20s. Mm -hmm. He was a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. He was sat alongside of me in the lifeboat. And to me, he had passed out. In other words, he was dead as far as I was concerned. Right. And this became quite objectionable to me. Mm -hmm. So I kicked him overboard. Yeah. And it was most distressing that the body kept hanging around the side of the lifeboat. Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of thought that stays with you. Oh, yes. 
Yes. And, and, and you, you're never convinced of the fact that maybe he was not dead. That maybe, maybe I made sure he was dead. That lingered with you throughout your life, didn't yeah, it? That's right. Exactly. Oh goodness, what a what a story! What a well on the San Fulon, on that ship, we were finally picked up. Mm -hmm. We were only twelve hours in the ocean. In that time, we lost twelve men in that lifeboat, mm -hmm. just from the cold. Yes. We were picked up by a Canadian corvette. Uh huh. I had no awareness of being picked up. I was probably just as dead as the fellow I had pushed over the side. But a young Canadian took it upon himself, cut my clothes off, my sea boots, my clothes, everything. And he stripped down himself. Under a blanket, he just warmed me up. Oh. On occasion, he would spoon a little rum into me uh -huh. and brought me back. Isn't that? Do you think I know that Canadian's name? No. Never got his name. Never got his name. Never made an effort to find his name. Isn't that something? Yes, you know that that is not uncommon. You know, in in stressful times like that, I, I interviewed men who fought side by side in, in the Hurtgen Forest, you know, or, or in the Battle of the Bulge or the Normandy landings. Right. And they had no idea who they were with, you know, really, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well. Well, well I've thought about it since, you know. I'm, I'm of a mind that the body slips into a, a condition where you're between here and there. Yes. To all intents and purposes, you are dead. Yes. But there's just a sliver of life yeah. perking within you. Isn't that something? And if a, someone recognizes that yeah. and takes advantage of it, mm -hmm. there you go. You start all over again. Well, you were you were blessed, I should say. I should say so. I should say that yeah. that's incredible. The um, now. Both of these ships, were they British owned or were they American ships? British. They were British, British, British tankers. And as you said, you were headed for Aruba in the uh, Caribbean. That's right. And that's where we would load our oil. Yeah. Dutch West Indies. That's right. Right. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, that's interesting too because, of course, Aruba, they'd get the oil from Venezuela. Sure. Sure. That's how it all came about, isn't it? I think it? Curacao was another port that we went into, Curacao, too. Curacao, yeah. yeah. How about that? Did you drink a little Curacao, too? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that, was, that was a beautiful port to be in. Too. Oh, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure that you enjoyed being in the sunny, sunny climb when you got there. You bet. It wasn't like Scotland at all. No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Well, tell us some more. What, what other incidents come to mind? Uh, on the high seas. Uh, another, di another different ship uh, were you on besides the Cameronia and these two tankers? I went to Buenos Aires on a ship called the Trojan Star. We went there for beef. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oh, that was a great port for a sailor. Oh, man. It must have been. I never got there. It must oh. have been just beautiful. The waterfront was heaven. <laughs> 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 and uh, I remember coming back from an evening ashore. And on the waterfront, we were two or three of us, we were walking together and we walked towards the staircase. The damn thing started moving. And we weren't sure, is, is that moving or is it just us? <laughs> 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 and 
And it so happened that was the first escalator I had ever seen. Oh, how about that? And <laughs> sure enough, we, we got enough savvy, you know, after seeing it start up two or three sure. times as we approached. Then we, uh, we went to the top and eventually got to the ship. <laughs> but you know, at that time, uh, the chief of police was trying to clean up the waterfront. And he had uh, horses on duty, mm -hmm. policemen on foot, and uh, they would pick up sailors, British, Norwegian, mm -hmm. Greeks, what have you. And they, uh, you'd be shut up for the night. They were let go the next day, of course, mm -hmm. but they didn't get out until they had cleaned up the stables. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so you know darn well the sailors went ashore with their best dudes on. Of course. <laughs> and they come back with horse stuff all over them <laughs> and stink into high heaven. <laughs> That'll teach them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, how did how did you deal with the uh, with the Spanish language? The girls knew enough English. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Of course, Argentina had a lot of a lot of British people there. It wasn't unusual in Buenos Aires to see pictures of Hitler in shop windows. Oh. So there's a lot of Germans there and oh, Italians. Sure. And of course the Italians were allied with the Germans. Sure. Yeah. So as I say, there was commonplace to see Hitler decorating the window. Oh, yeah. And Which, of course uh, the, uh, the Graf Spee was sunk there just outside, outside the mouth of the River Plate. That's exactly right. Well, we left Buenos Aires, and that was some weeks after the Graf Spee battle. Okay. And we had to make our way around the wreck of the Graf Spee. Did you really? A uh, considerable part of the superstructure was still showing above water. Is that so? I didn't realize that. And uh, we, made our, we were going into Montevideo. Mm -hmm. We were going to pick up some passengers there who had been shepherds somewhere in the interior, right. Scottish shepherds. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, making our way into Montevideo. We passed the Graf Spee, and we were passing this ship. We was flying a Nazi flag. Hmm. I didn't find out later until we realized what was going on. But all of a sudden, Nuts and bolts and heavy stuff started raining down on our decks. The crew from this ship was throwing that stuff at us. <laughs> oh, for <laughs> this was making warfare on, <laughs> on us. So what were we to do? We, we had to retaliate. <clears throat> there was nothing at hand. We went to the galley and we got potatoes. That was our response to their attack on us. You threw potatoes we back threw the potatoes in the We threw potatoes in there. <laughs> well, my goodness. It that, that lasted for a couple of minutes because very yeah. soon we were out of range. Sure. But that was the, our battle of, of the river plot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should write that story. I don't know if that has ever been written up by anybody. Well, I'm sure nobody on that ship I was on would have the savvy to do any writing. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> that, was, that was a four-masted ship that I was on, too. Oh. And not many four-masters were. And uh, to this day, I still remember the names of the four main mizzen and jigger. Right. And while sailing back, I remember seeing a four-masted barg at sea. Mm -hmm. The most beautiful sight Gorgeous. I can imagine. Gorgeous. Fully sailed. Oh, wow. 
and the wash in front of it is yeah. just gorgeous to look at. Oh. You see paintings of it, but yes. hey, to see yes. it is an experience. Well, there are, there are books. Our library history department right here has books about the, the great sailing ships. And uh -huh. you, the, when photographs were taken, you know, so you could see still There was see. a time in my boyhood that I remember s the sailing ships sailing in competition with one another right. from Australia to Britain. Yep. Right. I mean, it was an annual thing that went on. Called the Grain Race. Very, very popular. They were bringing grain from Australia to exactly Britain. Exactly so. Yeah. And that was a big thing, like the transatlantic liners, you know, later on. Constantly trying to beat one another's record. Trying to win the blue riband. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, you, honestly, I've never spoken to a gentleman that had this uh, sort of fascinating experience such as, and you were still a youngster by this time. I mean, what were you? I was still less than 20. Yeah, you were under 20. Oh, yeah. Good heavens. My goodness. You could write a book, David. You should write a book. You know, you, t you talk about those ships sailing for the blue ribbon across the Atlantic. I saw the first Queen Mary be mm -hmm. launched in Clyde Bank. You saw her launched? Right. Down the ways. Uh-huh. Down the ways, and there was another river over this way, and she was backed in there, and she got stuck in the mud back here. <laughs> the tugboats had to pull her out, and they managed it all right. But I was over here, which today is the Glasgow Airport. For heaven's sake. <laughs> it was just a field then. Sure. But, uh, and along then, just a happenstance, you know, we, we were school kids then who went down just to see that because it was written up quite extensively. Mm -hmm. But the next Queen Mary that I saw was, uh, it wasn't actually the Queen Mary, it was the Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. It was the next big one. Yeah. And my experience with that was that the ship I was on was sailing up the Clyde. This monstrous <laughs> behemoth of a ship was sailing down. This was the Queen Elizabeth. Hmm. It hadn't been equipped. It was, yep. it was able to sail, and yep. that was all. She was going to the outfitting dock or something. She was on her way to New York, oh. where it was going to be outfitted. Oh, in New York. New oh, York. So she was going to sail. Hmm. I find that out later, of course, yeah, but right. that's what happened. Right, right. So the queens were part of my experience. Well, I should <laughs> say so. And of course, uh, uh, they're, they're both, you know, the Queen Mary is in uh, San Diego. Exactly. And uh, QE1, where's the QE1? I'm not sure where she I is. I think they sold it to the Japanese. They might have. Scrap iron. Yeah, they might have. And, uh, well, honest to goodness, this is just absolutely amazing to hear your story as a young, a young man at sea. And uh, um, Now, the last ship I was on, yeah, the last British that. ship I was on, was called the Pentridge Hill. You know about the Liberty ships in yes. the United States. Well, it's, it's brother in arms from the British shipbuilders. Right. Not a very substantial ship. A terrible ship to sail. Hmm. But we loaded up in Glasgow with six locomotives. We had four on top and two down below. They were welded to the deck. <laughs> we had trucks. We had everything imaginable all bound for Russia. Uh. Now, not Murmansk. Coming around the Atlantic, around South America, or South Africa, up the Indian Ocean, to Iraq. Not even through the Suez Canal. Oh, the Mediterranean was ruled by the Germans. That's right. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't use the How about that? Mediterranean. Anyway, 
we got into bad weather. Again, we were in convoy and it broke up. Oh my gosh. And uh, no enemy action on mm -hmm. our part, but the storm was such that we lost our cargo. Now you can imagine locomotives being torn from the decks and going into the bulkheads. Slamming against them. Just. And there were two down below. They too were torn from their moorings. Uh -huh. But fortunately, they jammed somehow down there. Mm -hmm. And in such a position that it wasn't too much of a factor in our sway. Right. But you know, you lose one locomotive and it would tilt the other way. And bingo with another one. Of course. Well, we lost those, all that deck cargo. We lost our lifeboats. Goodness. The, the decks were simply swept clear. Mm -hmm. So we had to go back. We, we couldn't go forward. We went back into Glasgow. Oh. How and far away were you by that time? We were about two days out. About two days not, out. Not a very far, not far north of Ireland. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could fix up. And we loaded up again. And we, we made our way finally to hmm. Iraq, mm -hmm. which was very much under the British control at that time. Right. Iraq wasn't the same Iraq today. No, no. Old Mesopotamia. That's right. <laughs> Even Iran was under control of uh, Britain. At oh, that yeah. Time. Sure. Yeah. And it was still called Persia then, wasn't mm -hmm. it? That's right. Yeah. Boy, you've lived a lot of history. It's just amazing. <laughs> well, <laughs> you don't realize it when you're doing it. You no, know, that's true. It's, it's only on reflection that, that's, you know, that, those that's true. incidents become of any consequence. Did you keep memoirs or anything like that? A diary, memoirs? Don't you wish you had? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I try to recall, you know. Yes. And I, I gave this guy what pages I had written, and but I was—I am no author, so I. If you sat down with a writer, do you think you could have you could reconstruct it? I could give him a lot of information, and he could yeah. probably make a story out of uh, it. Well, it's a fascinating story. I—it's uh, just uh, it's. I mean, what you have experienced and what you have seen and what you have survived, good heavens. Well, my name is Ted Gardner. As you know, this is our second round with David Murray. A delightful, delightful, wonderful, heart-wrenching and spirited story of his life. Uh, in not only World War II, but first in this country and then his homeland of Scotland. Incidentally, I met a gentleman last week who was born and raised on the Isle of Lewis. Right. And you were raised on the island of? Lewis. Same island. Absolutely. L-E-W-I-S. Wonderful. Isn't that something? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so, uh, David, we left you uh, in the hospital in Abadan, Persia, now Iran, and uh, this would have been, what, 1943 or 44? 41, I would guess. 41? 41. So you were, good heavens, you were only 18 years old. Right. Uh -huh. And why were you there in the hospital? I was displeased at uh, my whole circumstance on board that ship. Uh, what ship was that? What was the name of her? The Pentridge Hill. The pa Pentridge Hill. Pentridge Hill. It was a British ship. We had those uh, Victoria, of, what was the malt, the ship that was built in tens of thousands, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The American ship had a particular name. Liberty given, ship? Liberty ship. Okay. The Pentridge Hill was a British version of that. Yes, that was the, that was the hull. 
right. the whole style. And uh, I, I wanted to get off the ship. I complained about having a sore hand. <laughs> well, the medical person looked at it and perhaps surgery could be called for. He was simply playing into my yes, story. that's nice. And I had that surgery done, but I was informed early in the morning, you're going to back aboard your ship. And sure enough, that ship sailed hours thereafter. Oh. So I was stuck, much with, with the bandage still yes. on my hand. Right. Assuming that the captain is going to be my doctor mm -hmm. and he will do whatever <laughs> has to be done later. And that was done, mm -hmm. no problem. Right. We sailed, we went into uh, down, down by Madagascar. We put into Cape Town. Mm. And this was a sort of tramp steamer. We picked up some little cargo there. I don't know just what it was. But we sailed from there to Trinidad for a cargo of sugar. Another British possession at that time. Oh yes, yeah. absolutely. We, uh, we expected to get some liberty at that time. <laughs> and of course, that being the case, we wanted some money too. Well, the skipper was reluctant to give us money. I don't know why. Well, I do know why. You he knew done well we were going to go ashore and get drunk and not come back. Jump ship. So, <laughs> and that was in Port of Spain, right? Port of Spain, Trinidad, yeah. exactly. And the time came when not having any money, not being able to go ashore, <laughs> They had to go around to the other side of the island to fulfill their load of sugar down to, around to San Fernando, I believe it was called. Hmm. And we had to lay at anchor some miles offshore. But we, the crew was not going to take the ship around there because, well, we wanted money. Why didn't we get money? We had earned it. Sure enough, when the time came to actually move, the British Army came up for it. Mm. <laughs> and they, they saw to it that we moved that ship. <laughs> so we went around to the other side of the island and we loaded up. We did get our money eventually and we went ashore there. Yeah. But of course we had to get a ferry to take us ashore. But it, you know, let me ask you, it's an interesting point that I think you're, you're bringing up here. <clears throat> you were merchant man. Absolutely. You were not military. No. And was there a resentment among you fellows against the military, uh, resenting their... It disturbed very much that our own, well, Old Not uh, professional, but in a sense, people class-wise, they were our peers. Sure. Right. And uh, that they should put us at such a disadvantage. Yes. But we survived. Okay. So you got a load of sugar. Got the load of sugar. Sailed up the east coast through the through the. Uh, Mexican, the Bay of Mexico, okay. or what is it? We, anyway, we sailed up to Baltimore. Oh, around the Gulf of Mexico. Right. And around Florida. I that see. was our destination with sugar. Ah. And at that time, I saw another opportunity for my getting off that ship. So while I had signed on as a Britisher, I said, no, no, no. No, anymore. <laughs> so I declared myself to the, the authorities that came aboard as an American. Right. And of course they disputed that. After all, I had signed on there my a name and a British subject. Well, okay, there. You uh, decided to be an American. 
<laughs> so they, uh, they put me under guard. After all, those were tough times. Right. The fifth column was a very much feared operation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that Nazi organization was, was big in New York. Mm -hmm. So they put me under observation. Everywhere I went, there was an armed guard. Really? I would be over the side painting, maybe. I'd look up, and there was him looking down. Somebody watching you. I'd come out of the forecastle, the guy standing there waiting. Hmm. It took them about 10 days to verify my claim. Right. And verify it, they did. They sent word down to the ship that I was to report somewhere up there in downtown Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And there was a group of, oh, I'd say four or five old gentlemen who parried me with questions of all kinds. Sort of like a draft board or something? No. No. I don't think it was concerned with the draft. Okay. But I remember being parried with, are you aware that President Roosevelt had forbidden American citizens to be in such and such latitude and such as, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I was just a boy, you know. Sure. And uh, <laughs> they were genial enough, but they, they were high pressured at the same time. Mm -hmm. And but you had your papers, you had your passport, had no everything. Sure. I had no papers. Oh, you had no papers. I had no papers. How did you prove your citizenship of, of I, the U.S.? I indicated where I was born, oh. and they verified it. Oh, I see. And bingo, sure. I was in Lake Flynn. So I went up to New Jersey, where I, I had a, a nominal cousin living mm -hmm. there. I stayed there perhaps a week, and I decided that hey, I've got to, I can't be a passenger all the time. I've got to do something now. So I went over to New York to the Siemens Union there. Mm -hmm. My plan was to go back as a merchant seaman on the American side, whose pay was going to be about tenfold that of the British seaman. <laughs> but they wanted me to go to sea now as an ordinary seaman. Oh. Well, I had sailed a couple of years as a seaman, which is just a step below able seaman. So I said, no, no, I wouldn't do it. So I went farther down the line, and I went to the, the U.S. Navy recruiting office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now this is 1941 or 42. Had, it had to be 42. It was after this, Pearl Harbor. Right. Okay. Right. We were at war now. Yes, I got you. And uh, within a week, I guess, I was called, sent to uh, Great Lakes, mm -hmm. went, went through my paces there, assigned to uh, Naval Training Station in the Ford plant in oh. Detroit. Oh, interesting. You know, you are given a series of tests, they determine where you're going to be most useful. Your capability and, and so forth. So they sent me there. I guess I was there about six or eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And then I was assigned somewhere on the west coast. What were you learning at the Ford plant? Machinist work. Ah, gotcha. Then they sent you to the west coast. They sent us to the west coast. We were going to be a, a ship repair unit. Oh. And they were being assembled out there. San Diego or San, San Francisco? Diego, exactly. San Diego, exactly. But uh, the decision was made, I guess, that they had more need of us in Europe mm -hmm. rather than the Pacific. Right. So they sent us back to Virginia in Norfolk. And while waiting in Norfolk, we were assigned to a civilian crew in the Navy Yard. Hmm. 
I was working with a group, I would say, maybe of 10 men. Right, ship fitters. Ship fitters and boiler makers and sure. what have you. Welders. Exactly, everything. Yeah. Right. And being a part of that gang, I dressed like them, I talked like them, I looked like them, and I acted like them. And then going aboard this one ship, the officer of the day noticed that I, I had not turned to the rear and saluted the flag. Uh -huh. First thing you do coming aboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he created some kind of hell. Oh, gee. <laughs> and he wouldn't let me aboard the ship. Hmm. Then the boss of that gang that I was working with, he tried to persuade this mm -hmm. this officer that uh, <clears throat> I'm an integral part of this crew that we are working at, on a engine that you guys screwed up on the maiden voyage of this ship <laughs> and you're going to be so petty as to keep him from going aboard. This officer was quite insistent. So the supervisor of that whole enterprise came down. He tried to persuade in turn this officer. And this officer was quite adamant. Was this a naval officer? Absolutely. He was, oh. a, he was a lieutenant. That was, yeah, that was his orders. I'll be darned. But then the supervisor of the yard came down on his little motorcycle. <laughs> and he was packing, you know. Uh -huh. Packing some heat. <laughs> and, and he was just as disreputable looking as I was. <laughs> And he had the foulest language mm -hmm. that he addressed this officer with and told him to get off the bridge. And he called for the captain of that ship. And he, he roared into him too. Mm -hmm. And he, he was persuasive enough that <laughs> I went along with the gang who were already working down yeah, the engine. Sure, surely. Uh, what <clears throat> This was a ship that was going to be carrying supplies across the Atlantic? It was a destroyer. Oh, it was a destroyer. And oh. it was a... Uh, you remember the class? It was a new ship that had just come mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they had gone out and in the maiden voyage out there, they had a crew, a, a civilian crew with them, mm -hmm. but they had somehow had screwed up the... Uh, the engine. Mm -hmm. So it was in for a considerable repair. I should say. But you know, that officer turned out to be one of the Hollywood boys. Oh, was he? What was his name? Oh. He, he, was a, he was a doctor in one of those TV series that came on after the war. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Um, yeah, well, anyway. I, sh I should know his name. Anyway. He, yeah. uh, I, s I saw him la later come ashore in England. Oh. And he was climbing up the ladder, and he came up on the quay, and our eyes met. <laughs> I could see that he recognized me, but he couldn't recall yes. from where. Couldn't place you. And I just stood my back on him. <laughs> went my way. <laughs> no sense in screwing that up. <laughs> he wasn't going to get a second shot at me. <laughs> no, I should say not. Okay, so there you were on that destroyer, and uh, and as you say, she was a new ship. A new ship, uh, exactly. which was was pretty darn exciting. And uh, um, so, were you in uh, in convoy duty, or what? What was your duty on that ship, or the ship's duty? Mission. Well, I didn't sail on that ship. Oh. I was just in on the repair. I see. From there, they assembled, reassembled that unit, the ship repair unit, and sent us to New York. We boarded the Queen Mary, and we sailed over to Scotland. How about that? Wow. So we, we put down anchor in the River Clyde, and about an hour later, 
I was at home again. Isn't that In my old neighborhood. <laughs> isn't that something? That is, that is just remarkable. It was just grand. <laughs> Being able to go transatlantic uh, by, by way of Uncle Sam. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so you went ashore. Did you, ha you had some uh, liberty there? We had liberty time? from time to time. We were set up in uh, <coughs> Princess Louise's castle down in a place called Roseneath. Hmm. We were there for uh, maybe a month. Mm -hmm. And then we were sent down to a working base down in the south of England. A little place called Saltash. Hmm. On the outskirts of Plymouth. Okay, right on the right on southern the shore. Front. Yeah. And uh, I had to find time walking the hoe. You recall the story of the hoe where uh, Francis Drake was playing bowls yes. when he was informed that the Spanish Armada was approaching England. Right. And he was direly needed. Yep. When I have completed my bowling game, then I'll give the Armada my attention. <laughs> Just imagine. <laughs> so, of course, the Armada never did get to England. Never got there, but that was <laughs> one of the one of the great, great points in history. It was indeed. Not just for England, but for the world. For the Absolutely. world, indeed. Right. Well, you you were living history there all the time, weren't you? <laughs> now, did you, did then uh, after that, were you back to the States or where? From there, we were there quite a period of time. Mm -hmm. And we were working on landing craft oh. primarily. A little, maybe half a mile from us, was another repair unit that worked on torpedo boats. Mm -hmm. Well, we intermingled, although professionally we we kept. We worked on land craft; they worked on the torpedo boats. But on Liberty, we would go down the coast. We'd take an old truck, just commandeer one of the naval trucks, go down to a little place called Glue. And the bars there were the kind of places where you had to bend down to walk into. Really? And beams were keeping the roof of the mm -hmm. up. Sure. And there was an old an old pirate hangout, really. At least we were so told that. Now, I think English people might have been just, you know, smoking weed for, for <laughs> our benefit. But we we absorbed the atmosphere. It was very nice. Right. Oh, it was very good. I should say friendly pub. And then came the time to invade Europe. Yes. Eisenhower determined that July six. And I think it was on July the 8th that we were packed off on board an old battered ship. It was called President Warfield. Ah, an old transport. Well, it might have been called a transport, but what it was really was an old <laughs> Chesapeake Bay ferry boat. Really? And you know, multi-tiered. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Shallow draft. Absolutely. Oh my And how God. the devil they ever got it over there, oh. I don't know. Can you imagine going across the Atlantic on that? Oh. Crazy. Well, that was June the 6th was it. invasion. Right. Uh, at Normandy. So it was so a you, couple of days later that couple of days. we were, we landed over there. Wow. And we sailed across, of course, and we went in behind a breakwater. There was a breakwater created at Omaha Beach. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe 50 or 60, just sunk. Mm -hmm. And that did break the yeah. weather from right. the channel. Right. And we stayed there and I, it was odd that time to figure out just what our purpose was. <laughs> I know I, I worked on evaporators, mm -hmm. which was 
converting a factory for making fresh water sure. out of salt water. Right. That was my function. But from time to time, I'd be off duty, I'd go up and talk, and a landing craft would be coming alongside with bodies that had been picked up. Hmm. Those would be attended to, they would be taken aboard, and what was done with them thereafter, heaven only knows. I know. But it was a, it was a sad, yeah. sad business. Probably taken out to sea eventually and most likely buried at sea. Most likely. Yeah. Well, so you, were you under fire from, uh, from the Luftwaffe, for example, the German aircraft? No. No. The Luftwaffe and what German army was there on the 6th mm -hmm. was out of sight by right. June the 8th. <laughs> They just weren't to be found. Right, right. Yeah, we were moving. We were moving inland rather moving quickly. Ashore. At that point, did you see? Uh, did you have any contact with the British troops? Uh, invasion? No, they were down to our left. Yeah, Juno Beach. What was this name? Juno. Juno. There was another one though. There was another beachhead. Well, yeah. Well, of course, there was Omaha Beach. That was an American. That was the American main landing point. That's right. And, uh, but anyway, uh, the a, a, at this point now, um, you say there you were there for what a couple of weeks uh, aboard this ship, the Warfield. We were there for maybe three months. Three months. Oh my goodness. And I think they had given up the idea of ever moving that ship. I see. They had torn out the main, main mm -hmm. engine, the mm -hmm. reciprocating engine, you know that. I see. And uh, I remember working on that too. <laughs> but uh, the strange thing is that some long time later I heard again about the President Warfield. Oh. Long after I had left it. And that was renamed the Exodus. Exodus. Wow. Now, does that ring a bell? Oh, but does it ever? That's right. Absolutely. Tell us about the Exodus. That uh, assumed quite a role in the establishment of Israel. Absolutely. And that poor old ship went back and forth from Israel to, was it Cyprus? Mm -hmm. I think Cyprus. Right, Cyprus. And the British wouldn't let them into Israel because no lines had been established at that point. Right. So the Israelites were still fighting their way in. Yes. Even, eventually they, yeah. they made it, of course. Sure. Oh, I, this is just amazing, the history that you have experienced and seen and uh, people will be so interested in learning about this because um, you know that is that was a very 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 seminal point in in history and the establishment of Israel and the and terrible time of trying to get the the Israel or the 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 Jews to it's having Get reverberations them. right Get today. Them. Sure, yeah, right, oh, right. 60, 70 years ago. I should say so. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that is just amazing. I, I had no idea that you uh, uh, had that experience too. Okay, so after that, uh, after that was done, then now, what what rate did you have? Were you a water tender or a machinist mate or what? Machinist mate. Machinist mate. It's second mate. Second class. Right. So you had you had two stripes, two, two stripes. chevrons. That's a wonderful. That's a good rate. That's an excellent rate, and of course, uh, a very old navy rate. A very right. old navy rate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so from the there, what happened? Well, there was all kinds of activity going on in the Pacific. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> <I'll say. laughs> there was need for ship repair units in the Pacific. Mm-hmm. So they packed us up, sent us back on a 
Landy Craft tanker. Mm -hmm. Good sized ocean going vessel. Right. And we came into we came into I think Norfolk again. Mm -hmm. Maybe Newport News mm -hmm. to join it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were sent across country to Bremerton. Bremerton, Washington. Right. By train. By train. <laughs> the old choo choo choo. Yeah. The old right. steam driven trains. <laughs> Chattanooga choo choo. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we did some repair unit work there. That was a huge yard. Oh, it was, right. They built battleships there. They handled aircraft carriers. Yeah. And big stuff. And uh, by that time, the Pacific War was winding down. Mm -hmm. There was, wasn't so much need for us. <clears throat> so they assigned us more or less at random. I was sent aboard a destroyer. Simply maintenance, we weren't going anywhere. But uh, the time came when need for destroyers even was non-existent. So we sailed that destroyer down to San Diego. I never saw so many destroyers in my life. Yeah. All in what we call mothballs. Mothballs, that. And that was eventually what we worked on doing to that one destroyer. Oh, so you did the, <coughs> you did the work of, uh, of uh, preserving and covering <laughs> right. them up. Right, putting all the machinery in good working order and then moth proof it. Right, right. And what kind of materials did you use for that, David? You remember? <clears throat> how, how were we going to preserve the engines? With, with, with naval grease or, or, or what? Well, that was part of it. Yeah. But then there was an, an envelope that was sprayed oh. onto those pieces of machinery and right. onto their guns. And right all the, the vital parts, right. even up in the, in the wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. That was all preserved too. Mm -hmm. For all I know, those b destroyers are still lined up there, waiting for another war. Well, unfortunately not. Most of them have been scrapped. <laughs> and you know who bought them? Japan. <laughs> How ironic, huh? How ironic is right. Oh. Before and after the war, we had, the United States had this business relationship with the Japanese. Yeah. It's hard to believe sometimes, you know. <laughs> well, that is, that is so fascinating. My goodness, the amount of history that you've seen, uh, um, early, early, early pre-war, and then the war, and then the, the post-war, so you really, uh, you never got out into the Pacific? Never did. No. Isn't that something? Yeah. And of course, I, did you remember uh, before that happened that you might be sent to the Pacific, you know, before the bombs were dropped? We assumed that we would be going to the Pacific. Right, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then August right. the 9th came along, August the 6th, uh -huh. 1945, the bombs right. were dropped. And that ended it all. You know, a thought came to mind when you, uh, you spoke at one time. Was there something about the Cameronia that you might have forgotten to Yes. Mention? I was fascinated by that. And there was one occasion, you know, we went back and forth from New York to Glasgow. Yes. And naturally, we came across the, the north of Ireland. Mm -hmm. On one occasion, we did not come north of Ireland. We came south of Ireland. Uh -huh. And we didn't know until later what its purpose was, but we were diverted up through the Irish Sea mm -hmm. back to the Clyde. Oh. Now, why were we diverted to the south of Ireland? As it happened, that was the time that the British Army was trying to get out of Europe. Oh, and yeah. we were heading for Dunkirk. Oh, my goodness. 
And it was determined before we got well on our way there that the cargo that we were carrying was too precious to risk mm -hmm. going into Dunkirk because the German Air Force was pummeling the oh, British yes. Army. Right. Pushing them toward the English Channel. Exactly. Yeah. And ostensibly we were on our way to help rescue them. Right. But it was determined that our cargo was more valuable than what we could be there because mm -hmm. the chances are we would, de we would be destroyed. Yes, yes. And enough small craft, pleasure boats, almost rowboats, right. made their way across the channel and yes. were serving the purpose of rescuing the British Army. One of the most remarkable evacuations of all times. Precisely. And you think of evacuation in wartime that it's a retreat. But in this case, it was saving the British Army. That's exactly what 200, happened. 200,000. Yep. It was a most remarkable story. I had a friend who was in the British Army, and he, had, he walked from the outskirts of Paris oh. all the way to Dunkirk. Oh, my goodness. And he had never taken his shoes off. It was just, his feet were just. Yeah. That was, over, that was over 100 miles. That's right. And he never was the same. He never could walk properly oh, after that. Oh, my gosh. And you remember, remember the, the helmets that the Tommies wore, you know, the same thing that they wore in World War I? <laughs> of course. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Goodness <laughs> sakes. That well, was, That was the lot of the Tommy. Yeah. So there you did not... You did not see any of the Dunkirk ac activity or action? No, that was just one, might have been. It might have been. Well, that's, uh, that, that is just remarkable because, as you pointed out, how the English people rallied to that rescue effect. Men and women sailed Men the and boats across the Small boats, rowboats all the way up to exactly. private yachts and everything. Yeah. To evacuate those soldiers. Surely did. And the Germans, of course, as you can tell us better than anybody, the Germans really blew it. I mean, they could have wiped out the, the British Army. Yeah, they could have. But they did not have the spirit to do it. They could have invaded Britain very easily. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was really the low spot. Just imagine having to save over 200,000 British soldiers. Yeah. Those were the days when Churchill rose to us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, we've all looked at the uh, pictures in the old Life magazines and, and now, of course, the great history books that are put out. And uh, uh, so impressive to see those snaking lines along the shore of the hundreds of thousands of men waiting right. to be lifted and not yeah. knowing whether they were going to be made no, it or no not. Idea. No idea what they were going into. I know, no. I know. Well now, so the Cameronia uh, uh, went back to Glasgow. And delivered her cargo. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't whiskey. <laughs> no, that was not whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've told people that story so many times since <laughs> meeting with you about your unloading the whiskey and getting a few bottles left over. Oh, and <laughs> sure, at the expense of dozens of broken bottles. Oh, of course, of course. Well, <clears throat> you've got a you've got a million stories, David. Tell tell us some more of the. Uh, can you think of the uh, some more humorous aspects of your? of your experiences? Going ashore, having liberty, or uh, meeting girls, or, you know, anything that you can think of. Let me tell you about a story of World War I. Okay. The Isle of Lewis probably provided, percentage-wise, a higher percentage of its population to the British Navy. Oh. At the end of World War I, this ship, the Iolair, was making its way back to Lewis with a load of 
British sailors. Mm -hmm. They were within sight of their hometown. They had come around the lighthouse, which guarded the, the harbor. But of course, there wasn't a sober man aboard. <laughs> that included the officer staff. Oh, goodness sakes. And they ran aground on an island. Oh. And that was one of the saddest days of the war. Oh. Although the war was over. Yeah. To the population of Lewis. Oh my goodness. When I was a boy, which was in the 20s, that wreck was still there. Really? And from the wreck to the shore where I lived very close by, was about a mile, mile and a half. That close in? That close in, exactly. But we as boys made a discovery. Down at the bottom of the breakwater, we would be scrounging around and we were finding money. Silver money, copper money, and for the longest time we couldn't figure out what it was coming from. It was British money though. British money. Okay. And <clears throat> it came to pass that that money was being washed ashore from the wreck of the Ayalea and it was of course being stopped at the breakwater. And that's where we were finding all that money. For heaven's sake. It was valuable to us. Of course. To little boys at play. Did you ever save any of it? No. <laughs> no. Money was for spending. Of course. Oh. And sometimes it was just for giving to our, our parents. Yes. Because yes. in the 20s there was it was rough going in the island. It was, it was rough, rough times mm -hmm. at that time. What was the main interest, in, industry on the Isle of Lewis? Herring fishing and Harris tweed making. Ah, oh, yeah. And that was made by at individual crofts. Yes. In my time there, a factory was established uh -huh. and they started machine making Harris tweed. Yes. Yeah. So as that, a, as that a boy, was the business of Lewis. As a boy, I had a Harris Tweed suit. <laughs> my parents had purchased in Vict. My, you were well clothed. Well, my parents had been on a trip to Victoria, British Columbia, in the 1930s, early 30s, and mother had bought a bolt, a bolt of sure. Harris Tweed, brought it back home, and had me fitted with a, tw a Harris Tweed suit. As a boy, I was about 12 or 13 years old. And of course, Harris Tweed, it still exists, but of course it's changed so much over the, over the centuries. Right. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, were there a lot of, <clears throat> were there a lot of uh, sheep on the island of Lewis? There were a lot of sheep. And That provided a playground for us too. You know, they'd shear the sheep. Yes. And there was a storage place for, for that wool. Oh yes. And it wasn't treated at that time. It was just sh taken off the sheep, and stored, mm -hmm. and there was a playground for the kids. You mm -hmm. know, stinking. <laughs> stinking. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> oh God. But as I say, on the island of Lewis, it was a playground for the kids, and salt too was a playground for the uh -huh. kids. And salt was used for preserving the fish, the, the herring. Oh yes. Which was exported to European parts, mm -hmm. to Latvia and uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lithuania and those they parts make, of the uh, Baltic. Make British kippers? Oh absolutely, <laughs> kippers, right. As a matter of fact, many is a box I made in preparation for the kippers. I'll be done. Uh, getting getting back to that ship and its its uh, complement of uh, of British tars, uh, were there were the men saved off the ship when she went aground, or did very few survivors? Really, very few survivors. No, that was shallow water, wasn't it? No, not really. No, no, it was quite deep. Oh. There was a great rise and fall 
Well, tides. Tides there. Yeah. Right. Oh, my Actually, goodness. Actually, the, in the harbor, there was probably a, at least a 20 foot rise and fall between high and low. Right. Right. Yeah, so they that, must have come in there at high. Uh huh. And then you wait for high tide to go up, right, of course. Right. Well, that's about the same latitude, you know, as as the maritime provinces in Canada. In Canada, exactly. Where they have the high, high, high exactly, tides. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, that that is such such a sad story. We hadn't heard that before, and and but as you point out, the terrible toll, losing all those fine young lads. That's right of a small area of the world. Yeah. Tell us some it, more it's, about it. It's probably known only to those in, in uh, Lewis. Yeah. I'm I, sure it's written up somewhere, but I, I'd never heard of that before. Yeah. But... Um, I had a teacher who on Armistice Day, she would raise her desk and she would say her prayer. Oh. And she would tell us the story about the island. Isn't that something? Oh. She lost a brother. Yeah. Well, of course, your your homeland or your <laughs> adopted homeland, whatever you want to call it, it's hard to explain exactly <laughs> what you were. <laughs> but and, and northern Scotland, of course, was was where uh, you know where the German navy uh, surrendered and, and they brought the ships in into uh, Scapa Flow. Scapa Flow. There's a name. That's a name that just <laughs> brings up all sorts. Did you go, to, were you ever at Scapa Flow? No, I didn't. That was in the Orkneys. And I, I never did the get Or to the Orkneys. Yeah, you were in the Hebrides. Right. Right, right. right. Um, uh, going back in, uh, when you were, you were in and out of, of the Port of London, weren't you, during the in the early part of the war, no. you were never in the, into London. No. So you were the not there. The ports I hit would be Glasgow, uh, Liverpool, Manchester. Ah. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, that would be it. Mm -hmm. On mm -hmm. that side. Mm -hmm. And over on this side, it would be New York, Baltimore, and the islands down off South America. Right. Right. And of course, Buenos Aires, Montevideo. Yeah. And Rio. You were going to tell tell us tell us again about, which to me is very so fascinating about the, the Graf Spee, and your your close, uh, <laughs> not encounter, but you were in the area, of the scuttling of the Graf Graf Spee. Well, the the Graf Spee had to go into Montevideo because she took an awful beating from the, a running battle right, the in the South Atlantic. The, yeah. and, uh, I think she was engaged initially by a cruiser. Then, of course, the word got out and uh, all British ships in the, within thousands of miles oh, <laughs> made yeah. their way yes. to engage the, yes. the Graf Spee. And she was in such bad shape that she really couldn't continue. Couldn't. Have been. It wasn't a matter of choice on the no. part of the, the no. German captain. Right. So well, that, they that. couldn't. They couldn't further engage the British who were waiting, waiting outside the River Plate. Right. Yeah. Well, Uruguay was a neutral nation, of course, and that in Montevideo was uh, was the port. Capital. Exactly. But so they couldn't stay there either. No, couldn't stay. No. Had a certain few hours to get out. That's right. Yeah, Captain Leinsdorf, of course, committed suicide. Now, how did you get that name? Oh, I, I, re <laughs> I, I read a lot. And he, he, he was in a hotel in Montevideo and he committed suicide, you know. He committed suicide. Yeah. He right. couldn't face... He couldn't face... He couldn't uh, face the shame of it. Yeah, he couldn't Although face... he was... Well, he, he felt was it was the honor. Nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah, he felt it was the honorable thing to do, yeah, of course, because right. he had to give up that beautiful ship. Uh -huh. And he, of course, he couldn't face the Fuhrer or Heimlich Himmler or any of that, that crowd. Or even Goebbels. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Well, so many people don't know about those times, David, and, and there you were, a youngster. Just imagine being a youngster such as you were. I can't get over By it. By American terms, I suppose I was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> you were a wee lad. <laughs> well, uh, the crossings of the Atlantic. Did you ever encounter U-boats or were U-boats in the area nearby? You know, I told you about the San Conrado. Yep. Where we had been torpedoed. Yes. No, no I beg your pardon. The San Conrado was the one that was bombed. The San Florentino was the one that was torpedoed. Ah. And I spoke to you about it taking four torpedoes to really cripple that ship. Yes. Because in our evasion efforts, we just literally broke the ship in two. Wow. So by the time we took to the lifeboats, there was the bow and there was the stern. Yeah. And the stern was so, with the anchor way up here, mm. or the uh, propeller, propeller up here. And the rudder. And the rudder. Huh. Well, we were in the boat for some period of time, not long. But that submarine that sank us surfaced. Oh. Surfaced within 50 yards of us. Really? Whew. And with a megaphone, the captain addressed us and asked us if we wanted a tow <laughs> to closer to land. Yeah. And of course, I told you too that ru rumors ran rampant among mm -hmm. sailors. Mm -hmm. We didn't know for a fact, but we were told that it was commonplace for a submarine to take a lifeboat and tow and submerge with the tow. Pulling everything down. And take everything down. And we put stock in that because yes. the purpose of the Nazis was to get the men as well as the ship. You could be interned for the rest of the war. Yeah. yeah. Golly. But if they, could, if they could drag this lifeboat down, they were going to take maybe 30 men. Mm-hmm. Hey, that was a feather in their cap. Oh, I should say. Yeah. But so, we, re we had sense enough to refuse. Okay, now you, okay, so you refused the enemy order, and what happened? He just went he, his way. He went his way. Right. Did you see him submerge and go away, or did he stay on the surface? I really don't recall. Yeah, yeah. He was of no interest to us. Right. Right. He had done his dirty work. Yep. And we were concerned about our own welfare. Now that was a petrol tanker? It was a tanker, but she was light. Ah. So you, you had no cargo. You I had just see. empty tanks. Ah. So you were riding high in the water. Absolutely. And that was why both parts stayed afloat. Ah. Now I see. We were given to understand later that uh, some naval ships came along and had to sink them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because there were hazards to the hazards to navigation and, and so forth. You. My goodness! I mean, this is stuff of history books, David. <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed, and it's yeah. history, and it's stuff of of Hollywood movies and everything. You know, yeah, it really I guess it is what you really. Really what you've experienced. Oh, I, I thought sitting in a lifeboat, seeing the stern part of that tanker oh. with the, and the moonlight shining on a, on a oh. rough sea. It was just a beautiful sight. Oh, it could have been. Oh, my. If I only oh. had a camera. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Lost opportunity. Absolutely. <laughs> We've all had those. I could have been a star. <laughs> you could have. Oh, you could have. Well, any, uh, any, any other uh, 
experience such as that that comes to mind? Now that no, that was the same. The name form. came to me. Okay, good. Montgomery. Yes. What was his name? First name. Bernard. Montgomery was the officer's name who was on duty. He was the officer of the day on that. Oh, destroyed. Robert Montgomery. Robert Montgomery. Movie star, handsome That's guy. Handsome guy. That's right. I remember his being a, a naval officer. Right. And he was the guy, this SOB. Played many hell with me. <laughs> SOB that was giving you all that, all that static. That's right. Robert Montgomery. Oh, he was a handsome fellow, you know. Sure. He was a matinee. He, he was a they, lover boy. He was a what they called a matinee idol, you know. Uh, the women yeah. just fell for him. Yeah, he was just a pain in the butt to me. Oh, <laughs> my God. Well, you know, he had a little bit of uh, position and a little bit of uh, strength, so he was going to... And he was going to assert it. Robert Montgomery, for heaven's sake. Um, of course, he's dead and gone now. Oh, yeah, he's long gone, long gone. Gone to that great... Uh, great destroyer in the great sky. Great destroyer <laughs> in the sky. Uh, well, you know, it's fascinating, too, about your knowledge about... Uh, mechanics and as you say um, desalinization of water and all that sort of thing you've got all this experience it's just amazing what what anything else come to mind about how did that water taste after it had been evaporated terrible awful wasn't it it was awful yeah but evidently it was it was portable yeah Oh well, yeah. If there was nothing else you'd, you'd that was it. take it, right. You couldn't drink the seawater <laughs> straight and, out. And the worst part of, about <clears throat> being in charge of that aspect was that every now and again you'd have to shut down the evaporator and you'd have to go inside that piece it, mechanism yeah. and break all the salt off yes. the inner tubing. Right, right. Oh, what a chore that Terrible was. duty. Just awful. Horrible duty. Okay, well, we're about to wrap it up here. Um, so the war is over, and uh, uh, let's see, the war would be over, and you were 22 years of age. When did the war end? 45. Yeah. 23 to 45, so you were 22 years of age 22. plus. And then, uh, quickly, what happened? Uh, did you come back to the States right away as a civilian, or what? Where were you? Where were you? I was, I was discharged from the U.S. Navy at Lido Beach, New York. Oh, Lido Beach. Sure. Right off Long Island. That's right. Yeah. And I made my way to Chicago, ah. where there was another <coughs> wild cousin. And uh, of course, I had left school when yes. I was 14. Right. Well, I couldn't very well just go to college. No. So I had to get the GED, as they okay, call it then. Okay, sure. I went to evening school, took a couple of classes, passed the exam, registered for college on the GI Bill. Right. And that was the best thing in the world. Isn't that something? America and never made a better investment, ever. Ever, ever, ever. We were all so fortunate. That was one of the great, great decisions of our government, right. <laughs> you know. Uh, I think it was a better investment even than we made when we took, when we bought Alaska. Absolutely. <laughs> Two cents on the dollar. <laughs> uh, so the, did you ever have, did you ever have any <clears throat> questioning of your citizenship? Uh, after every, every teacher I was engaged with in college would look askance, where are you from? <laughs> I don't understand you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you've got that beautiful Scottish brogue that is just. And one actually ins insisted that I go for remedial speech. <laughs> <laughs> and another one, don't you listen to her for heaven's sake. You keep that. Absolutely, that you got. <laughs> absolutely. Well, it's just been a remarkable experience to to hear your story and to uh, know about you. And I know that your, your family and friends are going to be delighted to see this DVD of you and hear these stories, probably some things that they've never heard about. 
and uh, probably true. and now you're in the archives, and uh, people can uh, learn about David Murray and his remarkable life. And well, I appreciate your kindness. Well, we thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. I hope our paths cross again. Yes, indeed.